Oh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see you all here this morning. In the book of Exodus, God tells Moses that no one can see him and live. Several hundred years later, Isaiah says back to God that surely you are a God who hides. God has to hide because of who we are. And yet because of who he is, he hides not so that he can keep himself away from us forever, but so that he can reveal himself. Today we're celebrating the festival of the transfiguration of Jesus, when Jesus revealed his glory to his disciples for two reasons. One, to prepare them for his death, to show them who he truly was before they would watch him suffer as a man. But also to show us that as we go through our crosses in life and as we walk the road to the grave, we know what to expect on the other side. That's what we'll be focusing on today. And we'll begin on page four with our opening hymn. So God bless your worship. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature, and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his holy life and innocent death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, to be the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, In the glorious transfiguration of your only begotten Son, you confirmed the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah, and in the voice that came from the bright cloud, you foreshadowed our adoption as your sons. In your mercy, make us co-heirs of glory with Jesus our King, and bring us at last to heaven, through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The power of the gospel message does not rest with us because the gospel doesn't have its origin with us. It had its origin with God. And Paul writes yet that we keep this treasure in jars of clay, not so that we can hide it away from the world, but so that God can reveal it in us as his power. Our first reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts, to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We now read our psalm of the day, Psalm 2, responsively. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. For the works of Jesus, please stand. Our gospel for this morning, which will serve as the basis for the sermon, comes from Mark chapter 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain, where they were all alone. There, He was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. 
the Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated for our hymn of the day. In the name of Jesus, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. So if you could see the road that lay ahead of you in life, would you want to? If someone could tell you what is going to happen in your life during the next year or the next five or the next ten years of your life, would you want to hear what they have to say? I think at least part of us wants to say yes. I'm just not entirely sure that would be a wise choice. As we get ready to begin the season of Lent this coming year, all kinds of, or this coming week, I should say, all kinds of memories about how Lent went last year have recently been kind of flooding back into my mind. In fact, it it was a a Wednesday right before one of our midweek Lenten meals when it was first announced that college and professional sports leagues were going to be stopping all activities until further notice. It was that very next Friday that schools across the state shut their doors. And within just about a week's time, virtually everything in our life came to a very sudden and screeching halt. 
And so let me ask, if, if you had known already at that point everything that was going to happen during the year between then and now, would you have wanted to? If you could see in very vivid and accurate detail every activity that would be canceled, every plan that would need to be changed, every celebration, every birthday, every graduation that would be missed, every day of school spent at home, every tear that would be shed, every outburst of frustration, every anxious or fearful thought, every single hospitalization, every single death. I think if we, if we could have seen all of those things ahead of time, we would have found it, well, disturbing to say the least. And so my vote for, for seeing all of that ahead of time would have most decidedly been no. No thank you. Disturbing is a word that we've been using to describe Jesus throughout the season of Epiphany, and it's certainly a fitting word. Everywhere that Jesus steps, in our world and in our lives, he makes waves. He disrupts and disturbs things. And that includes doing the very thing that, that I just described. Very recently, in fact, just six days prior to the events that we're going to be talking about today, Jesus had told his disciples about the road that lay ahead of them in life, a road that was full of rejection, full of suffering, full of shame, and full of death. And not just for Jesus, but for his disciples too. And so, surprise, surprise, sometimes Jesus' disciples don't want to hear that. Sometimes Jesus' disciples vote no to the road that Jesus describes for them in their lives. In fact, Peter especially was having a very difficult time with this. Peter sort of gives voice to every disciple of Jesus who would think that the road of life with Jesus should be paved with success instead of suffering, should be paved with fame instead of shame, should be paved with recognition instead of rejection. In fact, for any disciple of Jesus who would think that way, doing what Jesus did is really the most disturbing thing that Jesus could possibly do. In other words, the biggest waves that Jesus might make in our lives is not with one more big fantastic miracle that everybody sees, not with one more powerful speech in front of a packed house, but no, as we're going to see today, really, Jesus makes his biggest waves by pressing mute. As you think about the details of this story that we, we call Jesus' transfiguration, and you had to pick out maybe the one detail that would have been the most disruptive and disturbing had you been there to see it, what one thing would have made the biggest waves in your, in your mind, what might it have been? Would it have been the sudden transformation of Jesus' appearance? As suddenly all of that divinity that was inside of him came bursting forth in almost unbearably brilliant light? Would it have been the two dead guys Moses and Elijah, who suddenly appeared there with Jesus on top of the mountain talking with him? Would it have been the cloud of God's glory that enveloped them on the mountain? Would it have been the voice of God the Father? All of those details, all of those events certainly made waves. In fact, we might say that each one of them was God's way of turning the volume up notch after notch after notch, all of them was a way of God displaying exactly the thing, the thing that he said about Jesus, that this Jesus was no ordinary guy, that he was, in fact, the Son of God. But each of those details didn't just make waves. Each of those details made familiar waves. Each of those details echoed something that God had done with his people centuries prior. From the mountain to the cloud, to the voice, to the select company of people who were allowed to see it, even the, the detail of six days as a time reference that Mark mentions, all of it bears a striking resemblance to what God did for his people on top of Mount Sinai at a time when he was leading his people on quite the road through life, a road that led them from slavery in Egypt into the promised land, a road that was paved with all kinds of power, all kinds of glory, all kinds of miracles, a road that included things like the parting of the Red Sea that allowed the people to cross on dry land and destroyed Pharaoh's army in their wake, a road that included things like water bursting forth from rocks in the desert and manna, bread, falling down from the sky to feed the people. 
everything that happened on that mountain kind of echoed some of the things that God had done back on Mount Sinai. And do you know who caught it? Peter did. Peter thought to himself, I, I've heard this song before. I can name that tune right away. And that's why Peter said what he said. He said, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters. Peter liked the way that this road looked. This is the road Peter wanted to be on, and so this is where Peter wanted to, be, to stay. All of which is the reason why none of the details that I've mentioned so far are the most disturbing details of this story. In fact, Mark wants to make sure that we don't miss it. Mark uses a word that's a little bit unusual, a little bit rare, and also very dramatic. It's a word that refers to something that is both sudden and unexpected. And Mark uses that word not to describe Jesus' transformation, not to describe the cloud or the voice or the dead guys talking with Jesus. Instead, here's what Mark says. Suddenly, that's the word, suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one but Jesus. As quickly as it had all happened, it was over. God had been turning up the volume, notch after notch after notch, and then suddenly he presses mute. Yes, Jesus wanted his disciples to see who he was, but he also wanted to make it very clear that the road that lay ahead was still the road he had described. But why? Well, maybe this goes without, say, uh, without saying, but it is still very much worth saying that the road Jesus described was the road that Jesus was going to travel because that was the very thing that Jesus had come to this earth to do. Jesus came to suffer and die for us, to forgive our sins, to erase all of our guilt and to secure our salvation. Okay, fair enough. But remember that Jesus had said that this would be the road not just for him, but also for his disciples. So why? I mean, Jesus certainly could give us a road through life that looks a lot like the road that he had taken his people on as they traveled through the wilderness. A road where every obstacle that stands in our way is suddenly removed and we can walk forward with absolute confidence and ease. A road where every enemy that we might face is not just defeated, but humiliated in the process. A road where every need, every lack, every want that we might experience is magically removed as blessings just come springing forth from the earth or falling down from the sky. God could certainly give us that road, but instead, so often in our lives too, he presses mute. Very often the, the enemies seem to be winning and the obstacles won't budge. And rather than magically just going away, the needs and the lacks and the wants actually seem to get bigger. But when that happens in our lives, when Jesus presses mute, notice very carefully where that leaves us. It leaves us exactly where it left Jesus' three disciples, alone with Jesus, with no one and nothing left except Jesus. Is there any place you'd rather be? I mean, it's easy enough for us to say that Jesus is the only thing that we need in our lives, that as long as we have Jesus, we have everything that we need. But let's be honest, when the retirement account is fully stocked and when the jobs and the incomes are secure and when the kids are, are behaving themselves and when all of our bad habits seem to be kept well in check, and when everyone seems to love us and respect us, it's very easy for that to be nothing more than words. But when our road is paved with sin and shame, then all we have left is Jesus' forgiveness. When our road is paved with obstacles and failures, then the only thing we have left is Jesus' success. When our road is paved with rejection and scorn, then all we have left is Jesus' acceptance. When our road is paved with fear and doubt, all we have left is Jesus' protection. When our road is paved with obstacles that will not move and enemies that seem to be winning, the only thing we have left is Jesus' salvation. 
And so the very thing that makes this road so very difficult is probably also its greatest blessing, that it leaves us alone with Jesus. When Jesus presses mute, he makes waves in our lives because he leaves us with nothing left except him. So Jesus makes his biggest waves, perhaps in his disciples' lives and our lives too, by pressing mute. The most surprising detail of this story is not all of the flashes of glory, but when all of it goes away. Well, thankfully, Jesus wasn't done making waves with his disciples that day. And one more time, he did it by pressing mute. Here's what the gospel writer Mark tells us. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So don't tell anyone about this, Jesus says. Press mute until I've risen from the dead. Now, what's interesting is that in the verses following these, Mark tells us that as Peter, James, and John were walking down the mountain, they were discussing among themselves what this rising from the dead was all about. Seems a bit odd, doesn't it? I mean, we know exactly what Jesus meant. Seems like they should have known exactly what Jesus meant. But keep in mind what had just happened. As Jesus showed them all of this glory, he was making waves not just by by showing himself to be the Son of God, but he was making very familiar waves. He was echoing things they had heard and seen before. And so that was their entire frame of reference. That was their entire ability to, to think about and conceive what God could possibly do. And yet what Jesus was telling them, that yes, this road was going to lead to suffering and rejection and shame and death, but then past that, it would lead to victory and life and salvation. This was something completely new. This was something completely different. This was something that was out of the very literal box that our world is trapped in, a world where death reigns. That that box, that grave, would have a back door would have life on the other side, was just too big to fit in the very small frame through which these disciples viewed the world. And that's the other blessing that comes when Jesus presses mute in our lives. You see, when we maybe wish or maybe even ask that Jesus would sort of turn up the volume of his power and his presence in our lives, we too are limited to the things that we've seen and the things that we've heard, the things that we are familiar with. For Jesus to bless me in my life, it looks like this. For Jesus to deliver me in my life, it looks like that. And sure, I think we'd all agree that it is nice, it is comforting to turn on the radio and hear a familiar song. But Jesus came into this world to teach us a brand new song to teach us how he can use suffering to bring us joy, how he can use shame to bring us to glory, how he can use defeat to bring us victory, how he can use death to bring us life. When we ask God to just turn up the volume in our lives, we are limited by what we already know. We are forced to look back, but because Jesus presses mute, he makes waves. He forces us, rather than looking back, to look forward at the brand new, different thing that he came to do. Now, all of that being said, I still don't think I'd change my vote. As I stand here today, I don't think I would want the me that was standing here a year ago to know everything that was going to happen during that year in between. That being said, one thing that mountains are really good for is helping us get perspective. And certainly the Mount of Transfiguration helps us get some perspective. And so as I stand here today, I can say that I am very thankful for that road that is now behind us, that road that we have traveled during the course of the past year. Why? Because I think along that road and during that year, Jesus has done for us exactly what he has promised to do. Let me give you just one quick example. So as we start the season of Lent next week, this is going to be our theme for worship. A time to die. The big idea is this, that there are things in our lives that at times may have seemed as though they are beautiful, lively flowers, full of life, full of beauty, full of joy, but then then eventually they wither, they dry up, 
they decay, they shrivel. And as a result, sometimes the best thing to do, in fact, sometimes the only thing to do, is to bury them, to put them into the ground. But to do so with the promise that putting a seed into the ground brings, that through this apparent act of death, there is going to be new life. That's what we do really all the time as Christians, but especially that's our focus during the season of Lent. We die to ourselves in repentance and we rise anew through faith in Jesus. Lent is a time to die. But now you put that image and you put those thoughts in front of people a year ago. When employment is virtually zero, when everyone's jobs and incomes are secure, when the schools are all full of busy, noisy kids, when the gyms are all full of loud, screaming fans, when our calendars are full of every possible activity that we can possibly fit in them, you put those things in front of people and it might just fall a little bit flat. A time to die? It's a time to live, our former selves might have said. But now? Now hopefully God has done, hopefully Jesus has done exactly what he promised. During the past year, in many ways, we have been left alone with nothing but Jesus. And hopefully during the past year, we have been reminded, even forced at times, not to look back, not to think as though our promised land is some version of the way things used to be, and if we can only get back there, it'll all be good once again, but instead to look forward to something brand new. Hopefully Jesus has made waves in our lives in exactly the way that we needed him to. In fact, maybe during the course of the past year, at certain points, you've maybe wondered where God has been in all of this. And believe it or not, it was probably right for you to wonder that because very often God's power and his presence in our lives will be hidden. But when Jesus presses mute, he is making his biggest waves. When he presses mute, he is doing something for us that is truly disturbing, exactly as we need it to be. Amen. Please stand. Join with me as we confess our common Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in your Son your glory dwelt in human flesh and blood to bring us eternal life. Open the eyes of all people to see the glory of God in the face of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lover of the human race, Moses and Elijah appeared with the Savior in glory to witness that all the law and the prophets speak of him. Give all the pastors and servants of the church such clarity in their teaching that all who listen to them may hear the voice of the Savior calling them to life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comforter of the sorrowing, you alone can bring peace that passes understanding to aching hearts. 
Remember all who are ill, hospitalized, lonely, afflicted, or dying. Let them sense your presence, taste your peace, and experience healing and relief according to your gracious will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Immortal One, you raised your Son from the dead by your life-giving Spirit, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters who share in his endless life and glory. Receive our thanks for Moses, Elijah, Peter, James, John, and all who have fallen asleep in our Savior's faith and friendship. Bring us to behold with them the fullness of his glory in the age to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant to us, all glorious Trinity, for you are good and you love your creation. To you we give all glory, honor, and worship, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining us this morning, whether that's in person or online. If you'd like to take the next few moments to let us know you are here, you can do so at goodnewslc.org slash connect. And if you'd like to support our ministry with an offering, you can do so at goodnewslc.org slash give. Thank you. Please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. Let us pray. All glory and splendor, thanks and praise are yours, O Lord, Heavenly Father. You pierce the gloomy darkness of sin and unbelief with the brilliant light of your Son. You guided the Magi to worship the Christ and revealed the mystery of your eternal plan to save both Jew and Gentile. You declared Jesus your beloved Son at the Jordan River and with your Spirit you anointed him to be the Savior of all people. Bless our reception of your Son's body and blood that we may shine with the joy of faith. Use this most holy sacrament to illumine our lives and minds with Christ's forgiveness, peace, and comfort. Refresh our faith and help us to reflect this truth and grace to the world. We ask this that you may receive endless honor, glory, and praise from every tribe and language and people and nation. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for all of you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
The Lord's table has been set. You may now come forward at the direction of the usher and you may be seated. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which you have just received, strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith and the life everlasting. Be of good cheer, for your sins have been forgiven. Go in peace. Amen. Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. O God the Father, source of all goodness, in Your loving kindness You sent Your Son to share our humanity. We thank You that through Him You have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that You will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by Your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve You day after day. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when we next gather for worship, it will be Ash Wednesday, the, day, the first day of Lent. On that day, we will begin our solemn journey to the Savior's cross. While the joy of faith remains undiminished throughout the year, our rejoicing during Lent is muted and quiet. 
For centuries, therefore, the Christian churches have omitted their most jubilant songs during this season, including the word Alleluia, which means praise the Lord. Now for a time we say farewell to Alleluia. We do this to prepare ourselves for the quieter days of Lent. The Alleluias will return on Easter dawn as we gather to shout our praise to the risen Lord. Once again, good morning and welcome to you all. It was a joy to gather here with you in God's house today. Everyone's invited to stick around for Bible class and Sunday school. Sunday school will be meeting in here. Adults are con continuing our study of the book of Exodus. Teens will be over at Icky Sticky. Rumor has it there is a six-foot-tall giant gumball machine that has been installed over at Icky Sticky. So hopefully you have your quarters with you this morning. Teens. A couple quick announcements that I wanted to mention. Uh, as I mentioned during the sermon, we are starting the season of Lent. Lent actually starts on Wednesday with Ash Wednesday. We'll have six midweek Lent services over the course of the next six weeks. The service is at 6.30. No meal this year. Uh, we've talked about that and, and as you might expect with our current circumstances. But we'd love to have you tune in at 6.30. We will, or uh, join us at 6.30. We will also be live streaming those services on Wednesday nights. Uh, our focus on Sunday is what I, what I mentioned during the sermon. There's information about that in our service folder as well. And then lastly, wanted to mention Good News Groups. So we rolled out the information for that last Sunday. Sign-up sheets are, are still available on the table in the entryway. With that, I wanted to invite forward Mr. Tom ha Hansel, who is the chairman of our Capital Campaign Committee, our lasting footprint uh, capital campaign. And he is just going to share a brief update on the results of our efforts so far. It's, yeah. Uh, 
Um, I'm kind of relying on the slides. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Otherwise, I have a picture of it. Oh, okay. So, I'll, again, I'm just kind of reading to you. But we have, uh, we received 32 pledges. Uh, we kind of expected 41, but, you know, like everything goes, you never receive everything you expect. This is actually pretty good, I think. Um, the short-term pledges for the down payment were 93520 Long-term, 135300 for a total of um, 228,820, and then you add in that that large 300, we got 528,820. Um, so far, we've we've received um, 94,686. Um, so we're, you know, Pastor drew a, a nice little graph here, so you can see how we're doing. Um, so that's that's our update. I'll try to give these once in a while. Um, we have enough for a down payment then. Is that? <laughs> we, we should. Okay. And uh, I don't know if I mentioned it last week after the service or not, but there, are, there, there is progress being made both on our pursuit of land and our uh, design plans for our building. I think next Sunday would be a, a really good opportunity for a lengthier update on some of that progress. Um, I was going to mention in, as it relates to the capital campaign, compared to the last one that we did, which was just to raise money for land, this one is more of a marathon than a sprint. And so we, we're putting this update in front of you, and I think it'd be, it'll be good to continue to do so on a periodic basis. It is something that will continue over the course of the next three years. Um, there are also, of course, opportunities as we make our plans not only to, to raise more money, but the expenses are also constantly I in flux. Um, and so some of the things that you might hear next week relate to that, that we hopefully we'll have some opportunities to, to realize some cost savings as well. So I think we're in very good position to answer Tom's question to be able to move forward and hopefully uh, we will be closing on the land in the very near future with the goal of getting ready uh, to start the site development immediately and hopefully construction can actually start either late in the spring or early in the summer. So not to say too much in advance of a more thorough update next week. Thank you, Tom, and thank you to all of you for participating in our, in our ongoing efforts and keeping that matter in your prayers. Thank you once again, and God bless your week.